come up to us now. The dot is in. This is a GPS collar. And because we don't really know the, the future of the research, we've decided to put a, a thinner piece of synthetic leather here. So over time, this will just wear away. And eventually, the collar will drop off. So it means that, um, you know, this hyena's not going to be wearing a collar for the rest of his life, which we don't want. Um, this is the first time today fitting a collar with a drop-off mechanism. Um, so we'll see how it fits. We might have to make a few adjustments. Um, and then this GPS collar will take one position every single 30 minutes. And the battery should last about nine months. So, yes, um, we've got Sarah here, who's responsible for the bigger picture of the hyena research and also other research projects, as you've seen throughout COVID Chronicles um, on Okanjima and with Africat, Sarah has appeared a few times. So, Sarah, just yeah, give us a little bit of background on, on this spectacular <laughs> creature that we have here on the table. And, um, I mean, he's so woolly and beautiful yeah. and, and, and unfortunately, you know, we, we see these animals being depicted as villains so often. Um, give us a little bit of background on, on this guy. So it was really interesting to see his, his data and how he was moving between the two different den sites and how he was interacting with the cubs uh, from this den and how he sort of started playing with them, dominating them and then sort of became an integrated member of this clan. So it's really interesting. Not many people have looked at dispersal in brown hyenas. And we're just starting him tonight to just put a drop-off piece in the collar in case, you know, the research does stop and we're not here to take this collar off that we know one day it will rot off and this hyena is not going to be stuck wearing a collar for the rest of his life. See, that is, that is such an, a, a thing that we, we, we find we need to, in these times, we need to kind of think forward in, in what happens if we stop this project. Sarah said there's a chance of stopping this research. You know, now with COVID, it's it's crunched that for us. Mm -hmm. So the impact there is is quite big. So I think you know we we are so hoping that borders will open soon and that you know kind of travel and the interest and the finance that it brings mm -hmm. comes back to to reality. Yeah, I mean, is sadly you know today I think if animals don't have a value, a commercial or financial value, that they might you know not not be surviving so tourism gives so many animals and wildlife across Namibia and, and the world a value and if that value has been taken away then how much longer are our community is going to put up with Bloody lions hell for sure. or leopards so I think you know it's also it's also important for the, the wildlife that we we have tourists and we have that value attached to these animals absolutely so yeah to to you know, to end something like this would just be an absolute tragedy because incredible species are reliant on on the work that is done to understand them better. And uh, if we understand something better, I feel that, you know, we will definitely think twice before we react in any which way we do. So, um, you know, respect and understanding is, is what it's about. So conservation through education is our big thing. And um, yeah, hopefully we can keep this going as long as possible. You guys were here filming not so long ago, um, but since then a lot, a lot of things have changed um, in my life. Um, I was offered and accepted a lecturing position at Capel Manor College uh, back in the UK. Sad to be leaving Namibia after all this time, sad to be leaving my research projects behind. Um, as you saw, we're still putting collars um, on animals with drop-off uh, mechanisms fitted in, and I will be able to receive that data in the UK, and I will be analysing the data and writing it up probably next year. Um, so the research will continue on a sort of remote basis. Um, Louis will be here, he will be checking the the hyena den so that we can keep track of these wobbly hyena cubs, try and see what's happening with them. We are here at Okonjima Nature Reserve, home of the Africat, and today I'm joined by Wayne. How big or how is the impact of the COVID-19 on the research uh, projects that are taking place here and um, the whole tourism on the Okonjima property. Um, how much big of an impact has it made? <laughs> okay, well, 
It's not an easy answer, but uh, I'll try and make it quite clear. So if you wind the clock back uh, way in the beginning of Okanjimo, this place started off as a, as a cattle farm. Um, I grew up here, I've been here for 50 years. So uh, when I was here, you know, six years old, growing up with my father as a cattle rancher, realized that we couldn't make ends meet and needed a supplementary income. Yeah. And as most farmers in Namibia do, they would start with hunting. Post independence, tourism started coming in. Yeah. So we were hunting guest farms. And that was a very interesting concept because it is of such a nature that when you have those two together, the one can supplement the other. So if you have a drought, mm -hmm. your hunting tourism or your hunting guest farm can actually supplement the income of tourism. So it's actually one of those second eggs in the basket that make it economically viable. Yeah. We started that. And from the onset, really, it was quite clear that um, the, the, the hunting side of, of, of our second income, as it were, to supplement our cattle farming, um, didn't have a conservation aspect to me. It was very difficult. Um, properly managed, it can actually be very successful as a management tool for conservation, but very difficult to put into practice. And post-independence, uh, tourist guests started flooding into the country, yeah. into Namibia, because of you know, our environment is, is quite unique. Um, and we realized that's, that's the backup, that's the growth curve. And so we started concentrating more on the guest side of things. But as we grew into a specialized uh, ecotourism facility, we realized that because, mainly because it is so labor intensive, mm -hmm. you need lots of people. Yeah. I'll give you some figures, for instance. Um, an average farm, so we're not talking about the whole Okanjima Nature Reserve. Just let's look at Okanjima, the first property that started this. Mm -hmm. 5,000 hectares. Average piece of land in this area would normally, as a cattle farmer, employ the family that owns the farm, plus maybe five or six other individuals. Okay. When it becomes a guest farm, maybe 20. Hunting guest farm, maybe 25. Okay. When you highly specialize into hunting as a conservation tool, you may be employing 30 to 40. When you turn it into ecotourism, you end up with 150 people. Yeah, so you're yeah. actually supplementing the homes. And we know in, in Namibia, and it has been done by us at the same time, it was very interesting, did a, a, a project, a research project on Okanjima. How many people are directly involved or influenced by the salary earned by an employed person in tourism? Eight people, not indirectly, eight people who are directly dependent on a salary earned by wow. somebody that's employed in Namibia. But tourism, if you looked at the salary that is paid by that person, it is three times that when he's, uh, the farmer's only running as a cattle farmer. The moment you go into tourism, there is three times, at least three times, the salary. Yeah. So that makes it very difficult. Now you specialize in our ecotourism project, which for me was by far the biggest benefit in, for conservation, because our spearhead was always towards what can we do uh, to benefit conservation? What, what can we, what part could we play? Very quickly you realize that because of the dependency on lots of people, so as I was saying, labor intensive, you end up finding it very difficult when you sp specialize in ecotourism to have a second nest egg. Now, interestingly, most places in this country have built up these reserves by, by external funding. So somebody is donated, you get a bunch of shareholders or somebody has a big business and this is his, his hobby, so-called. That is great if you're fortunate enough to do that. In our case, there wasn't, so we needed to build up an operation that was, that was, that was directly built up by tourism. Step by step, every cent that came here uh, was brought in through ecotourism. And we quickly realized that you don't have a backup when you are running an operation that is so uh, expensive to run. So it is very difficult to find something that you say, oh, street tourism disappear. You basically have this as a backup, like a hunting guest farm. Yeah. So you end up with only one egg in the basket, very lucrative. And from a conservation perspective, I find it way outweighs um, anything else that we felt we could do that could benefit it. In years long gone by, governments could set aside a piece of land as a wilderness area and there's no benefit to the people and nobody actually goes into it because it's kept for a while. That's great. Yeah. But today that will not survive. We mustn't forget a very famous speech that 
the late Nelson Mandela gave. And it was about parks. And he said, in, in the end, it's about the people. If the people do not have a benefit in a park, the park will not survive, which is yeah. so true. Yeah. So now you have this setup where you're running it. You, you, you don't really have a good nest egg. So what you can do is, in our situation, because you don't have outside investors, you build up a nest egg, a war chest. So should there be bad times, and we've gone through many of them in the last 30 years, you, you supplement your income through your savings, your war chest. And for me, that was the only way you really could see, because I couldn't think of another business that if tourism went down, you could keep this all going. So you build up a savings account. But you usually do it on a model should you lose 50% of your business. Yeah. So any business practice that says I can survive with only losing 50% of my income um, is, is a good basic average realistic model to work on. Then comes COVID-19 yeah. and wraps the rug way from under us, we meaning from one month to the next, zero income. So that's a huge impact on everything that we've been doing here. So we've been planning and having a, a, a backup that can survive us a year uh, or more on a drop of 50%, typically like the global economic turndown in 2008, 2009. Yeah. That hit us in 10, 11, 12, we were down about 42% in our business on average. But survive that, so your model works, not this. So what does this has to happen is, we boil it down to what are the most basic principles that we need to adhere to. We cannot lose the home, the property, the reserve, the animals. Yeah. So the concentration is on all these wonderful additions we had. Nakajima is not just a lodge. It has environmental education center. It has a school giving education to pre-primary grade one, two, three for all our staff on the farm. So we had an education right program right here on the farm. Yeah. And we've had AfriCat as the program that I'll tell you a little bit about later that was actually the start of our conservation side of it. All these right now, and the research side is the most impacted, are not, they're not essential services, sadly. Yeah. We, we need to save the land, the animals, and the business that can then live to fight another day. So we are enforced in the next three months to close all those down. To be able to concentrate on a mode which we are saying is we are on survival, then we're going to be a recovery mode, and then we're going to go to a sustainable mode. Yeah. 